in 2005, what was your job assignment with the GBI? I was located at the Region 13 office in Perry, Georgia. Um, and um, did you have an occasion to be involved in the investigation of what was then a missing person of Tara Grinstead? Yes, I was. And um, when did you first learn that there was a missing persons case in Osceola, Georgia? Uh, the morning, it was a Monday morning, October 24th, when I got to the office in Perry. Uh, that's when I learned that uh, we had received a call from Osceola that there was a missing person. Okay. Um, and, and I guess to, to be for the jury's edification, um, the Perry office, does that just cover Houston County? No, ma'am. Uh, it covers multiple counties. Kind of down I-75, we skip Cordell, but uh, <laughs> Bay County, Peach, Houston, Dooley, uh, Irwin, Ben Hill, okay. several. Um, and so as an agent out of the Cordell office, um, was that the office that was assigned to investigate Tara Grinstead's missing person case? The Perry office, yes ma'am. Um, now, were you what we would refer to as the lead agent? to the residence of Tara Grinstead? Yes, I did. Can you tell the jury about what time it was that you arrived that day, morning, afternoon? Probably, uh, I think it was around lunch when I actually got to Osceola. Okay. And you said when you got to Osceola, did you go someplace before you went to Ms. Grinstead's home? No. Okay. Not yet, no. Um, were there any other agents present at the residence when you were there? Yes. Who else was there? Uh, Dominic Turner. Um, and then, um, do you know Jeff Rossler? I do. Um, at any point while you were present, did uh, Jeff Rossler arrive to process the crime scene? Yes, he did. Okay. Um, in addition to Dominic Turner and Jeff Rossler, were any other agents present in the hall that you can recall during the time you were there? Uh, no, um, Agent Gary Rothwell was a special agent in charge of the Perry office. He was in Osceola. Yes, sir. Yeah, but not right there in the residence. Okay. Uh, when you were at Ms. Grinstead's residence, did you have an occasion to look at her um, house phone? I did. Um, and that particular house phone, what kind of phone was that? Uh, it's an AT&T cordless phone with an answer machine built into the phone, but the handset is separate, meaning okay. it's cordless. Um, and do either the, the answering machine portion or the handset have what we then refer to as caller ID? It did. Okay. Um, did you actually take that phone into evidence? Yes, ma'am. Prior to taking the phone into evidence, however, um, did you record the messages that were left on that phone? I did. And the messages that were left on that phone, that particular recording, um, was that maintained in the case file? Yes, it was. Were you able to identify the voices of the persons who were list or, or who actually heard on that um, caller ID or excuse me on that voice uh, answering machine? Some of them. Okay. Bedroom. And is that in fact the original phone from Tara Grinstead's residence? It is. Um, have you had, the judge at this time, the state was tendered in Evidence State's Exhibit 134? Oh, I need a judge. No judge. Submitted without a judge. Have you had a chance um, in the recent 
pass to see if this phone actually still works. Yes, ma'am. And does it still work as far as turn on? The answer machine portion does work. Yes, it does as far as turn on. And the messages on that answering machine, uh, are they consistent with what you heard when you were recording them back in 2005? Yes, they are. So to be clear about it, let me ask this. When you were recording them, did you have to start over recording? Yes, originally uh, it showed 28 messages on the answer machine. When we started recording, uh, a call came in, interrupted the recording, we had to start it over, and it showed 29 messages, and then by the time we actually finished and had everything retrieved, there was 30 messages. So people were still calling. And did you have any personal knowledge as to whether or not uh, anyone had played those messages before you arrived at the crime scene? No. So as sitting here today, do you have any personal knowledge of that? Uh, no, I do not. Uh, Judge, if you don't mind, I'd like to have uh, Agent Godfrey step down for me. And I'm going to let you do this so I don't match the wrong button, press the wrong button. But if you can, will you please um, play the messages that are on that answer machine for us? We have 30 old messages. Thursday, 6, 22 p.m. Hey Sarah, this is Sarah. I'm just worried about this. Just want to check on you. Um, just need to be called later if you want to. If you don't feel like it, that's okay. I'm just going to check on you. See you later. Bye-bye. Thursday, 9.41 p.m. Screw when you don't call folks back. Hope you get the message.
first time. Can you see, uh, sorry, yeah, thank you, the phone on the screen in front of you? Yes, ma'am. Um, and again, for our jurors who may not have ever had a home phone, can you tell us what we're looking at with this phone? Uh, it's the AT&T handset uh, that's cordless that goes with the answering machine telephone there. Okay, and this particular screen in um, the top of the phone what is that screen? That's an LCD screen. Um, what is an LCD screen? A uh, liquid crystal display. What would this display, this particular screen display? It would play, uh, display the numbers that you dial when you're calling. Uh, it would display uh, anything saved on that telephone that you're scrolling through. Uh, your caller IDs, uh, directories, uh, anything like that is what that is for. Okay, so if I were to dial numbers here, mm -hmm. should they be showing on that screen? They should. Are they showing on that screen? No, they're not. Why are they not showing on that screen? Uh, the LCD display right now is not working. Okay. Um, prior to 
you the last few weeks had you had a chance to look at this phone since 2005? Yes. When did you last look at that phone? Uh, prior to prior to the last few weeks. Uh, yes. 2019. And when you looked at that phone in 2019, did you plug it up like we've done today? I did. Um, at that point, was the LCD screen working? It was. I uh, noticed a couple of lines. Uh, it's made up of lines. Uh, a couple of them were out, but it worked pretty good. Okay. Um, have you researched how you believe you can fix this LCD screen? Two things normally go bad with the LCD screens. Uh, the screen itself goes bad or there's a conductive ribbon that attaches the LCD screen to the circuit board. And it is attached with a adhesive. It's a conductive adhesive. And with age, sometimes they, they don't always come loose, but they lose their connectivity. So you would have to heat them and get them to hopefully make contact again. Okay. Um, and is that something that you think you probably know how to do? I can. Okay. However, have, have you attempted that at this point? Have you done that on this particular phone? Okay. Um, going back to 2005, um, when you actually, I'm going to leave that up there. When you um, looked at this phone, in addition to listening to the messages and recording them, did you also look at the um, the uh, caller ID? I did. And did you document the caller ID? I did. Um, when I say the caller ID, did you document every single caller ID that was showing on that screen? Yes, I did. And um, did you document? Um, would it show times? It would. Would it show dates? It would. Did it show uh, um, the number that was calling? Yes. And occasionally would it show either a name or, let's say, cell phone or something of that nature? Yes. Um, and, and caller ID, what we refer to as caller ID on, on those types of phones, are they very similar to what we're just used to now on cell phones? Yes, the technology is older. Yes. Uh, caller ID was different back then. A lot of it depended on if you subscribe to it or not, and if the incoming call and you both, well, where the call was placed would have to have caller ID capabilities, and then you would have caller ID on your phones. With cell phones and things nowadays, it 